Good evening, everyone. I hope you're doing well. My name is Sakosia, and I am the Community Ground Rounds of SNMA. Thank you all so much for joining us tonight for our second Community Ground Rounds of the year. To give you like a few backgrounds of this lecture series, the Community Ground Rounds focuses on strengthening and addressing healthcare dilemmas and disparities in underserved communities and ways to eliminate them. The event is a joint effort by our SNMA um, in conjunction with the Office of the Dean. Thank you so much for your help, Dean Michichi and Brittany. Today, Dr. Silliman Cohen is talking about the vulnerable and resilient as I'm um, talking about vulnerable and resilient as it pertains to the LGBTAIA plus youth. If you have any questions throughout the talk, please type them in the chat. And we will have a Q&A session at the end. I want to start off our program by handing the virtual mic off to Dean Cavalier. Well, thank you, Akusia. And thank you to our um, SNMA leadership uh, for co-sponsoring our event tonight with, uh, with my office. Uh, welcome students, faculty, staff, and friends to our final community grand rounds for this academic year. We are so thankful that you're able to join us for tonight's important uh, lecture program. We are very proud to collaborate with our Student National Medical Association for this lecture series to address an array of topics to improve the practice of medicine and healthcare delivery, as well as to address healthcare dilemmas and disparities. I always say that the mission of our SNMA is so aligned with the mission of Rowan SOM that seeks to be sure that we have a diverse physician workforce and that we are working to eliminate disparities to health care. I think tonight's lecture is an example of um, how we need to improve access to care. Um, for the Community Grand Round series, we seek out experts in various disciplines of healthcare. Experts and colleagues from SOM, like tonight, for example, uh, from New Jersey and across the country. We are privileged to have one of our very own, Dr. Rachel Silliman Cohen, for tonight's lecture. Dr. Silliman Cohen has recently taken the role of acting director of the CARES Institute, our own child abuse research and education service right here at the School of Osteopathic Medicine, a program that is not only nationally, but internationally recognized. She has an academic appointment as an assistant professor of pediatrics in our Department of Pediatrics here at SOM, and also an adjunct uh, assistant professor of peds uh, at the Cooper Medical School of Rowan University. Dr. Silliman Crowen is a tremendous leader and advocate within the medical profession for children and adolescent youth with more than a decade of experience as a pediatrician. And she's an expert in child abuse and neglect with a special interest in foster care, LGBTQIA plus health and adolescent health. She has conducted research on the subject of child abuse and neglect and has published articles in medical journals, including pediatrics and clinical pediatrics. Dr. Silliman Cohen is duly board certified by the American Board of Pediatrics in Pediatrics and the subspecialty of child abuse pediatrics. She graduated from the University of Maryland School of Medicine in Baltimore and went on to complete her residency in pediatrics at the University of Vermont, Fletcher Allen Healthcare. In her lead roles with CARES, she oversees the clinical, educational, and academic activities of Southern New Jersey's Regional Diagnostic and Treatment Center for Child Abuse and Neglect. She's also the fellowship director for New Jersey's only Child Abuse Pediatric Fellowship a joint program of Rowan University School of Osteopathic Medicine and Cooper Medical School of Rowan University. 
Rachel, Dr. Silliman, Cohen, thank you for joining us tonight and thank you for the leadership uh, you're showing of our um, highly recognized CARES program. Thank you. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. I'm just waiting for the slides to pop up. Okay. <clears throat> so thank you again so much to the SNMA, Grace Acosia, Dean Matici, Dean Cavalieri. It's a true honor to be here this evening will be here virtually this evening, um, especially in conjunction with at the SNMA, who is uh, an organization that I have really admired and supported since I was in medical school, which was very long ago. Um, today, I will be speaking about LGBTQIA plus youth. It's a, it's a mouthful um, and their vulnerability and their resilience. I have nothing to disclose. And before I get started, I want to do something that I tell all the medical students who rotate with me to do. So anybody who's ever rotated with me will roll your eyes. Um, it's really important every time we see kids at the CARES Institute to orient them and their families. Tell them what's happening, what's going on, who I am. Um, it makes everybody more comfortable, especially for topics that are confusing um, or difficult, so I'm going to do the same for you. Um, and one thing I, I want to say is it's okay to be confused. It's okay not to know all of this information already. I tell my patients all the time, people make mistakes. Children make mistakes and adults make mistakes. Um, I also tell them adults are not that great at uh, admitting that they've made mistakes, but they do. So it's absolutely okay throughout this lecture to be, to have questions um, and even after this le lecture to make mistakes about some of the terminology I speak about here today. Um, so I just wanted to say that ahead of time. So first I'll be speaking about the objectives of the lecture. I'll be talking about um, the definitions, health and welfare, legislation, and some resources. Okay. So my objectives, I would like everybody here to develop an increased comfort with terminology. And as I said, nobody has to be perfect. I would like everybody to consider ways to make our practices and office spaces proactively LGBTQIA plus supportive. I want, I encourage everybody to understand or learn about how LGBTQIA plus youth are vulnerable to health sequelae and adversity and also strong and resilient. And I do want to spend some time reviewing recent legislative challenges that I'm sure many of you have heard about as you, if you turn on the news or read news websites or newspapers. So first, I will speak about um, a case. Um, case number one, a six, it, and you're in a primary care office, a six-year-old natal male comes to your office with their parents. And when I say natal male, I mean they were born um, and identified as male at birth due to their genitalia and ge presumed genetics. So a six-year-old natal male has been telling their parents for their whole life since they could speak that they're not just a boy. Um, sometimes this child says, sometimes I'm a girl, and sometimes this child says, I'm both a girl and a boy, or I'm neither a girl and a boy. Uh, this patient has not been distressed, but has been persistent in what they have said about this. Their play, when their parents describe them, um, is imaginative and inclusive of both stereotypically boy and girl elements. They have an equal love for dinosaurs and bluey, which is a, a fabulous show. Um, and when they come to your office, they are wearing a Phillies hat and short hair. When their parents have looked up online 
things about children who are gender nonconforming, one of the definitions they came across was gender expansive identity. And they thought that this applied to their child very well. Um, and I'll speak more about that terminology in a, in a second, but what they described was that their child really talked about being both a boy and a girl or neither a boy and a girl or sometimes one or sometimes the other. Um, and they thought gender expansive identity really fit. This child has chosen to use they, them pronouns and does use they, them pronouns. So I'd like you to think as I keep talking about what would you recommend that this child's school do? And what would you do in your office? Not just with regards to medical treatment, but also with regards to the physical environment where you practice. So let's go on to some definitions. So LGBTQIA+, that's a, a mouthful of letters. Um, and the acronym really refers to, um, I would say two different parallel trains having to do with gender identity and expression and also sexual identity and sexual behaviors. And it actually encompasses both. So, and I'm sure many of you know this acronym already. So L is lesbian, G is gay, B is bisexual, T is transgender or trans, Q is queer or questioning, I is intersex, A is asexual or ally, and plus is referring to other gender and sexual identities. And what I'll say is that it's an expansive term and it has grown over my time as a person, my time as an adult from LGBT to LGBTQ to LGBTQIA. And I think that that's really important because what we know is that people's identities are all different. Um, and that's why it's important to ask and to have a questioning mind. So let me talk about these, these, ter these terms and this terminology. So the first thing to highlight is that gender identity does not equal sexual orientation. And first I'll talk about sexual orientation. So sexual orientation, so this is like this, this classic gingerbread uh, person diagram that um, is used widely to talk about gender and sexual uh, identity, but it's actually a really good image. So sexual orientation, um, that would be in the LGBTQIA um, acronym, lesbian, gay, bisexual, um, and other sexualities, uh, asexual as well. So that refers to sexual attraction and sexual behaviors. Oops. Sexual orientation um, is different than natal sex or gender identity. So natal sex is referring to somebody's anatomic genitalia when they're born and their chromosomes. Um, and really, most of us have the uh, experience being in the newborn nursery or being in the delivery room with that moment when somebody says, oh, you have a boy or oh, you have a girl. Um, these are my children. They both gave me permission to have this photo in this presentation. These And natal sex is actually also different than gender, gender identity and gender expression. So I see gender as something reflective of cultural beliefs and expectations. Um, gender identity is a person's knowledge of their own self, while gender expression is their outward expression of their gender identity. And you can see in this picture, two of my two children now all grown up and Olaf in the middle. Okay, and I really think that, and many people consider all of these axes as a as spectrum. So even sex assigned at birth is actually a spectrum. There's the there's the boy and girl identities, but there's also the uh, intersex identity, and gender identity also is a spectrum how people know themselves in terms of their gender and then gender expression. You might have a, one gender identity that does not match your gender expression and it may be existing on a, a spectrum. And then of course, sexuality. We know that people have uh, exist on a spectrum and actually for all of these things, as children and adolescents and adults develop, you may people may move along these spectrums depending on their age and development and their life. When I think about transgender identity, 
how I think about it is that it's really any individual who crosses over or challenges their society's traditional gender roles and expressions. And I think about it as an umbrella. And really it's important to just remember that everybody is different. There's the binary under the transgender umbrella, trans men and trans women, trans boys and trans girls. And that usually refers to somebody who has a natal sex of boy and has transitioned to um, who is now a girl or vice versa. But there's also a non-binary under the transgender identity. Um, people who, as our patient earlier in the presentation um, identified are gender expansive, are boy and girl, are bo neither boy and a girl, gender non-binary, and other terms as well. And what I would say is that terminology evolves all the time. There are other definitions that I'm not going to go through all of these, but the one that I want to just highlight is cisgender. So cisgender refers to people whose gender identity matches their assigned sex. So somebody who is born with the sex of a boy and who um, identifies as a boy and a man throughout their life. And these other um, terms are other terms that are used um, in the academic literature and also by individuals. And I can talk more about them offline. It's important to talk about gender dysphoria. So this used to be called gender identity disorder up until 2013. So when the DSM became the DSM-5 from the DSM-4, um, this became gender dysphoria. And this is really important. And the reason it's important is that prior to 2013, gender identity disorder um, implied that transgender identity was the pathology. So being transgender was actually a psychiatric diagnosis or illness. And in fact, people who went to medical school before 2013 probably learned this. I definitely did. Um, <clears throat> even though it was at the tail end and people were starting to question it, um, this, is, this is actually new. Gender dysphoria, however, is different. Gender dysphoria refers to the clinically significant distress that a person experiences related to the incongruence between their gender and sex. So the for diagnosis to be made, it has to last for greater than six months. And there has to be um, a number of other uh, qualities met that are in the DSM, but related to this incongruence. And it's important to identify that some trans individuals and some gender diverse individuals do not experience gender dysphoria. It's also important in ICD-10 codes and billing and insurance um, for medical treatment for these patient populations. So let's talk about the numbers, the national statistics. So like most statistics in my field, the statistics are limited. Um, in two different studies, sorry, excuse me, surveys done in 2013 and again in 2019, it was found that up to one in seven youth, and these were mainly adolescent youth, mainly in high school, identify as LGBTQ and or gender nonconforming. That's about 16%. And one in 50 identify as transgender, gender variant, or gender nonconforming. And that's the language used by the questionnaire. And that's about 2%. In older studies, it is identified that the age for coming out for youth is around 16. I, I, it, the literature has changed. I think it has been bumped a little bit earlier, more recently. And most people have an awareness earlier than age 16 about their identities. Um, and as I said, identities do evolve and change. One of the questions that many people ask is, do, does a transgender identity last? So say it's a young child, like the six-year-old that we were discussing earlier, who has an identity, in this case, gender expansive identity. Is that going to last throughout that child's life, lifetime? And what I'll say is it evolves for many children, but not for all. And about 15 to 30% of children have persistent gender dysphoria over their childhood into um, school age and teenagehood. Um, and it's important to identify that this is important and this is true in, in terms of the data and the subjective experience, but it is also utilized, this concept that people change over time is also utilized um, in a, almost a, a weaponized way for people who are anti-transgender. Um, and so it's some pop culture uh, references talk about it as, as um, in a negative manner. But that said, 15 to 30% of children with gender expansive identity and other types of gender identities 
um, that are outside of cis identity persist into older childhood and adulthood. So let's go back to that first case. Remember, it's the gender expansive six-year-old child who prefers they, them pronouns, who is not distressed, but who has persistently felt this way. His parents are very supportive. So what to do with school? So this child's school decided that the teachers, within in conjunction with the child's parents and the child themselves, um, decided that the teachers would use they, them pronouns when talking to this child and referring to them. They decided that they would read age appropriate books in the classroom about gender identity, but also about um, not just about gender identity, but also books that included people of different genders and, and also different races and ethnicities, um, just having a normal benign experience in these books, which is really important. Um, and the school counselor, the principal, the teachers in this school were all aware and supportive of this child's identity. The child requested that there not be a big coming out something for them during school. Um, and the teachers agreed that developmentally that didn't make sense to do that. And it was working very well. So what about your office? So the first thing uh, that many people ask about is documentation. How do you even write about this child? So I've modeled it above when I talk about this case. You use the correct pronoun, the correct identity, and also if there's a name change, the correct name. You can sometimes put in parentheses a previous person's name if it's an electronic medical record that doesn't have the ability to reflect transgender identity. But it's important to actually, in your medical documentation, reflect the child's identity in the moment. And even if it changes over time, that's OK. Your, your future notes can reflect that change, and it's part of the child's uh, psychosocial and medical experience. Um, you decide in your office that you're also going to buy different things to put in the waiting room or in your exam rooms that, that, that allow this child to feel included and seen in, a, in an overt way, so not just passively, but also actively in your office. Some, some people, so the, the final thing that you do is that you practice introducing your own pronouns and asking about pronouns. And, and honestly, it takes practice because this is not something that I think many of us are used to doing. Um, and a lot of times one way that people do this by get around this in some ways is putting their pronouns on their ID badges, for example. So this is an example from UCSF, um, which has a lot of resources about treating LGBTQIA youth and adults. Um, and they have he, she, her, hers on the ID, as well as the person's name. And Electra Abundance, this refers to um, an old movie from the 80s called The Paris is Burning, uh, which is about Vogue and culture. OK. So this child, in the end, went through essentially a social transition, or part, or partially went through a social transition. And a social transition is when a child is raised as their gender identity. So remember, this child had gender, um, was gender expansive, and was being raised as being gender expansive. And the parents did talk about how if the child changed their identity, changed, and they gave them ample opportunity to talk about that. They would change how they treated, how they referred to the child, and how they. Um, allow the child to express their gender. A social transition means that pronouns may change and that the name may change depending on the child, but it is reversible. And this book refers to um, Jazz Jennings. She's now in her 20s. She's an activist, a uh, trans activist. Um, and her kid's book, I Am Jazz, really refers to her social transition when she was first diagnosed as having gender dysphoria. She also has a reality show. So let's talk about data. So first, I'm going to split this up in terms of identity. So first, I'm going to talk about sexuality, lesbian, gay, and bisexual youth, because a lot of the data splits it up this way. And then I'm going to talk about um, youth who are non-binary, gender non-conforming, and transgender. So for lesbian, gay, and bisexual youth first. So we're going to go to a case. You see a 17 and a half year old transgendered male patient transgender male patient who lives with his father and he runs away frequently and he identifies as gay. So remember, transgender male patient, that means he was born natally female and transitioned to um, become a transgender male. He intermittently has taken testosterone. He was prescribed it about a year and a half ago by your office. 
um, but because he runs away all the time, has had difficulty accessing his testosterone. And his father has been unsupportive. And in fact, he has a history of being physically abused. This patient tells you that he has been sexually active, primarily with men, and um, he is there after being uh, found by uh, local police um, in a dangerous situation. So he's there for medical care. So I want you to think about as I keep talking, what are the next steps for this child, and what are the child what child slash teenager, and what are the child's medical and psychological needs? So let's talk about some of the data. So we know that there are mental health disparities between um, youth who are heterosexual and youth who are lesbian, gay, and bisexual. And in some studies, it is, it is identified that 75 percent of lesbian, gay, and bisexual youth have depression. And LGB youth, lesbian, gay, and bisexual youth are three times more likely to be suicidal. They also have lower self-esteem and higher anxiety as a population. Um, it's important to note that I'm going to be describing a lot of um, mental health and medical sequelae um, for this for these vulnerable populations, and it's these these characteristics are not because of some of children's inherent biology or pathology. It's related to the social fabric around them um, and the systems in place to support them and who may or may not be supporting them all that well. Um, being lesbian, gay, or bisexual does not lead to depression just because a child is lesbian, gay, or bisexual. And what we know is that parental support is protective. When, when children and adolescents have parental support in the context of their sexuality and their lesbian, gay, and bisexual identity, their depression is lower and their self-esteem is absolutely higher. It's the same for close friends. There are victimization disparities and children who are lesbian, gay, and bisexual have an up to three times more likely risk for abuse, both physical abuse and sexual abuse. They're more likely to experience assault by peers and they're more likely to miss school because of their fear about being at school and bullying and being assaulted. And this is significant. And again, it's not because of who they are or their identity, it's because of the things around them. Um, and it's important to note that the abuse disparities, all that really means to me is that a lot of these kids who have a history of abuse, who have a history of trauma, who also have these identities may not be receiving the medical and mental health care they need if providers are not familiar with lesbian, gay, and bisexual patients. And so that's, it's great what, that you're here. So let's talk about trans youth. So again, disparities exist. For individuals who are trans or gender non-conforming, they're six times more likely to have depression and eight times more likely, likely to be suicidal. That is a very high number. And 35 to 40% of youth who identify as trans are suicidal at some point. They're more likely to experience eating disorders, alcohol, cigarette, and marijuana use, and substance use disorders. And they also have an up to three time risk for each type of childhood abuse. <clears throat> Again, it's important to note that this is not because of the inherent patholo um, the inherent biology um, of being transgender or gender nonconforming. It's related to all of these other psychosocial things. The other thing to mention is that there is a myth that people believe that is not true, which is um, the myth is that trauma, sexual abuse, or physical abuse actually causes any some of these identities: lesbian identity, gay identity, transgender identity, etc. And it has been proven as much as you can prove anything with data that that is not the case. Having a history of trauma, specifically sexual abuse, does not lead to transgender identity. And it's really important to note. Um, what we know, that said, what we know um, is that there is this, this, these disparities, um, which just points to the vulnerability of these populations. And we also know that youth who have the highest level, level of gender nonconformity are at highest risk for child maltreatment. We also know, this is a real positive, that tr both treatment and parental support are protective. So for youth who are gender nonconforming and transgender, who experience a social transition, so remember that's no medication, that's just a child living their gender identity, um, 
their depression rates are equal to the general, general population. Their anxiety is identified as slightly higher than the general population, but it's still not in the clinical range. We also know from this study that as compared to transgender patients who are not supported by their caregivers, um, youth who are supported by caregivers have a lower rate of depression and a lower rate of anxiety. So our um, for support and protection is protective, as is treatment. We also know that medical and surgical treatments are similarly pr pr protective. So for children and adolescents who receive puberty blockers, that's GnRH agonists, and hormones, which could be testosterone or estradiol, um, they have a 60% lower odds of depression and a 73% lower odds of suicidal ideation. There's a study that looks at the longitudinal trajectory for youth who are transgender. And looking at that over six years, they have three time points looking at prior to um, any type of treatment at diagnosis, then they look to after social transition, and then they look at after both GnRH agonists, hormones, and then surgery. Um, and what is shown that over time, the gender dysphoria experienced by these patients is alleviated. They have improved psychological function and their, and their well-being is equivalent to age-matched controls. It's also important to mention coronavirus and the pandemic. So as you all probably know, there is an incredible mental health crisis for children and adolescents in our country in the context of the pandemic. And teenagers are not uh, immune to this, and in particular, vulnerable, people, vulnerable teenagers are not immune. So looking at this survey, just released actually earlier this year, it was identified that LGBTQ plus youth had differentially increased negative health sequelae, specifically mental health sequelae. Substance use was higher than their heterosexual peers um, and cisgender peers. Their mental health was uh, was worse. They had poor mental health, and 62% of them had for, poor mental health versus 30% of their age matched peers, and 50, almost 50% were suicidal, um, as opposed to 14%. And then, if you look at this bar graph, which is much smaller than uh, I wish it, I wish it were bigger, um, it, it also looks at other axes where you can see a difference. The dark blue and the middle blue are gay, lesbian, bisexual, and um, other quote unquote, other questioning identities. Um, and all of those are higher than um, their hetero heterosexual counterparts. And many of them are statistically significant. And I'll say this survey showed the same thing for students who are black and brown, that they had a differentially higher rate of poor mental health and other negative health sequelae in the context of the pandemic. So let's talk about youth in foster care. We know that LGBTQIA youth are in foster care more than non-LGBTQIA plus youth. 20 to 35% of youth in foster care are LGBTQIA plus, as opposed to that 16% in the population from my one of the for earlier slides. And for kids in foster care, 7% are transgender or gender diverse versus that 2% in the population. LGBTQ plus youth are more likely to be a, to be um, housed in group homes when they're in foster care or shelters. Um, and many have been asked to leave due to their gender or sex sexual identity. They are more likely to be identified as hard to place. And when you look at homeless and runaway youth, 20 to 40 percent of homeless and runaway youth are LGBTQIA plus, which is absolutely not does not match the general population. And so in this way, they're vulnerable. So when thinking about these issues, I thought a lot about, well, what's the answer? And what do, what have we been doing? And there's no great answers. And many people have been trying a lot of things to support youth, um, I think with some success. So many child protective services agencies, such as DCF in New Jersey, um, have an initiatives aimed toward um, LGBTQIA plus youth. So there's a website in the New Jersey DCF um, 
main website that is focused on these populations. Um, Lambda Legal Human Rights Campaigns, they all have resources for children who children and adolescents who might be in foster care or have run away and who are LGBTQIA+. There are also initiatives out there with varying um, successes, depending on the state, um, looking specifically for, uh, for um, resource caregivers, as they are known in New Jersey, or foster caregivers who are themselves LGBTQ+. Um, and there are also lots of initiatives out there for people to be educated about being foster caregivers for this po these populations. And so there are attempts made, and I think that the, can, the needs are ongoing. So let's go back to this case. So again, it's that 17 and a half year old transgender gay male who is intermittently on testosterone and he has a history of both physical abuse and running away. So I wanted to pause, this is not my to the topic, but children who run away, adolescents who run away from care are at very high risk for, for sex trafficking. And by that, I mean exchanging sex for money, drugs, food, or shelter. Um, in the United States, children under 18 who, who do this, who are, who are victimized in this way, this is considered sex trafficking, whether or not somebody, has, somebody like a pimp, for example, has made them do it. Um, and it points to si significant victimization and to trauma. And youth who are adolescents who run away are at very high risk of this, um, sometimes because of the need for survival. And in fact, um, I, it is also known as survival sex. And for many trans youth and LGBTQ, plus youth, survival sex is something they experience um, at, at high rates when they run away. So this child, when I, spoke, when I spoke with him, he denied ever being sex trafficked. But the other thing I'll say is that most youth who are being sex trafficked or who have had that experience um, are not particularly interested in telling you about it at, when they first meet you, which is not unreasonable. So anyway, this child denied sex trafficking. Um, and so what do we do? So the first thing that I think is important to do is to figure out how to keep this person safe, how to keep him safe physically, housing and shelter. And in this case, I did call DCPNP or the state agency in the state I was practicing. Um, and they helped him find emergency shelter. Um, this is historically a challenging thing to have done because DC PNP, Child Protective Services Agencies, have not traditionally been great at supporting these youth, but they are much, much better. And I absolutely, it's necessary to do. And for mandated reporters, you're legally obligated. So this child, we found emergency shelter through Child Protective Services. And also just kind of as a side note, we did lots of labs to screen because he had been intermittently on testosterone. Um, we did write a prescription for testosterone and ensure that he could access it because I would view testosterone for trans youth as um, a vitally important, sometimes life-saving medical treatment. And actually, we also considered all these other risks that he could have been exposed to, including um, sexually transmitted infections. We did testing. We offered um, HIV um, PrEP and considered whether we should uh, consider HIV PEP. Uh, post-exposure prophylaxis and pre-exposure prophylaxis and we pro and we treated uh, prophylactically gonorrhea chlamydia and trichomonas um, and we gave lots of anticipatory guidance and also as a side note hooked him up to mental health care um, in the context of his emergency shelter so let's talk about our health care environments because that's where we are so what we know is that many individuals who are LGBTQ+, both adults and youth, find it difficult to receive health care, even in the most um, positive and caring, and I would even say loving, medical environments, when they are not overtly supported or when they don't have the ability to identify themselves. And so that's actually why it's important to ask and to talk about these issues and to have the external environment that reflects diverse populations. And really our clinical environment matters and our educational environment matters. So the first thing that you can do starting at the door is the with the paperwork because we always have paperwork. And there is a way to ask about gender and, and um, gender identity and natal sex that is pretty much nationally accepted. It's called the two-step process. 
And so what it is, is that you have the person put their name on whatever form they're filling out. You give them the opportunity to identify their current gender identity. Um, and then you give them the opportunity to identify their sex assigned at birth, because both are medically important. And that does two things that that gets information you need to be uh, to do appropriate medical care and it demonstrates that you want to know you want to know this information because it's about your patient. And it's really important, so you want to show that you're able to listen and hear and ask questions you don't have to know all the answers. But it's really important to have curiosity and and as much as you can acceptance and support so some people when they do this two step. Uh, set of questions they have current gender identity and they talk about they have like check boxes so um male female trans gender male transgender female and um gender queer gender non-conforming all sorts of options and some just leave it as a you fill it in your own identity with a blank it's also important as we dis discussed previously with that young patient at the very beginning to think about your physical environment so that might mean having books in the waiting room um, about different identities of all sorts. Um, children, there are many, many great children book, children's books um, with diverse characters that I would be very happy to talk about offline. Um, it might mean identifying your own pronouns, either with your own badge or verbally. It might mean wearing a rainbow pin or having a rainbow somewhere posted or even those small things. I know they sound um, very much um, concrete, but they're actually important because it means that you're making an effort to um, create a, a positive environment. Um, it's also important, as mentioned before, to have the, your medical record reflect the patient's gender identity, pronouns, and preferred name. Many electronic medical records, including EPIC, have the functionality where you can even put this on the top identification bar where it has name and date of birth. And then some don't, but either way, it's important. So there are lots of ways to ask about gender and sexuality, and there are lots of ways to talk about it. These are some examples. Um, and I try all these different options in my practice when I talk with adolescents. And I'll say, I'll say that sometimes when I talk about sexuality and I say, oh, who are you attracted to? Sometimes I get the, oh, I'm attracted to boys, or I'm attracted to everybody, boys, girls, and trans people. And sometimes I get, oh, well, the guy I was recently attracted to, well, he was really into sports, and his name was Jack. And so uh, it's a, you know, it's a work in progress, but it's really important to ask open-ended questions. And, that, and that's actually a good one. So these are some examples, and I can provide this um, at the end, um, offline after this lecture. So let's talk about the recent legislation. So this is important for children and adolescents with regards to their mental health. Forget about politics. It's important because it affects our patients. Um, it, in the last year, there has been an exponential increase in anti-LGBTQ bills in, in many states. So 32 or more states have had numerous bills, and there have been about 240 bills either proposed to state legislatures, um, in legislatures, in committees, or passed or sent to the governor's office, many, many, many bills. And we know, based on a survey by the Trevor Project, that two-thirds of LGBTQ youth have had negative mental health effects just by the fact that these bills, that these legislative initiatives exist. And four-fifths four -fifths of trans and non gender non-binary youth have had negative mental health effects due to these legislative initiatives. And the wave of anti-LGBTQ plus legislation is, has been broad. Um, there have been bills authorizing or being against all sorts of things, including medical care, um, sports participation, identification, like passports and other types of things, and hate crimes. And I specifically wanted to mention Texas because it's with regards to my subspecialty, child maltreatment. So in Texas, at the very beginning of 2022, the, the Attorney General, Attorney General Paxton in Texas issued a legal opinion in the form of a letter saying that he believed that gender affirming care of children was child abuse. Um, and he alluded to both family members and also medical providers. And then and that was very, very concerning. It was just a letter by an, by an attorney. 
However, the governor of Texas, Governor Abbott, then issued a similar letter to the Child Protective Services Agency in Texas, DFPS. So what that meant was that once he issued that letter to Child Protective Services, two things happened. Mandated reporters were then required to report to Child Protective Services for any child who was receiving gender affirming care. Um, and many investigations of families occurred and families were directly impacted by these letters and by these, um, by these mandates. What ended up happening was that the ACLU, in conjunction with some of the families who had been investigated, um, sued. And there was um, an amicus brief written by the American Academy of Pediatrics and, uh, and Health for Society, which is the Child Abuse Professional Society, um, and other organizations. And ultimately, a judge ruled that there was a statewide injunction and these investigations were stopped and people are no longer required to make a report to Child Protective Services in Texas. That said, all, both the Attorney General and the Governor have, have put out tweets saying that they're going to fight this. Um, and as we know, Twitter is the source of all news information. So the final thing to say is that the United States Department of Health and Human Services did issue a statement specifically saying that it's discriminatory and illegal under federal law to deny health care to youth. And they included gender affirming medical care. And it's important to notice, so this, this is a lot of negative um, data about legislative uh, initiatives. It's important to note that actually the majority of Americans support lots of things for the LGBTQIA plus population. 70% of Americans, this is an NBC poll, 70% of Americans support same-sex marriage, 79% support laws that protect LGBTQ plus people, um, same with anti-trans sports bans, and up to 90% think in, in, a, in a set of 10 swing states thought that transgender people should have ac equal access to medical care. And what this demonstrates is that a lot of these initiatives are in the context of a small number of highly influential individuals. The final thing I'll mention is that in uh, last week, March 31st, 2022, was G Transgender Day of Visibility, and that happens every year. And on that day, President Biden and his administration um, created all sorts of initiatives protecting trans kids and adults. Um, and this is just a partial list. It's a huge list of things, and it's very positive and protective. Um, and I would, I would recommend you looking it up, but these are just some examples. And the final thing I, I'll say is that I've given you a lot of data talking about some negative health effects and risks and sequelae um, and vulnerability for these populations. But what I know is that LGBTQIA plus youth and adolescents as well as adults are a resilient population, set of populations. And many, most live happy lives, productive lives. Um, so it's not all about being identified by the negative mental health sequelae and vulnerabilities. But what it does tell us is that our social fabric and our societal institutions need to change. There goes my timer. So I wanted to briefly go through resources. So these are a list of some resources. I'm sorry, it's a little light, the orange. But these are different resources that exist. Most professional organizations that are medical professional organizations also have lots of resources to support LGBTQIA plus children, adolescents, and adults, including the Marion College. American College of Osteopathic Pediatricians, the American Academy of Pediatrics, and more. Um, and there are lots of nonprofit organizations that do the same. And then I'll briefly just say, I have lots of artwork in this presentation and they're all done by Patrick Heron, um, who is a, an artist whose art um, mainly housed at the Tate. Um, and everything else is either from a button archive for political buttons or from the stock PowerPoint image. Thank you very much. Does anybody have any questions? Hi, Dr. Emma Simon Cohen. Thank you so much for this presentation. It was very ed educational. Um, at this point, I'm going to look at the chat for the questions, but I do have a question. Um, so, like, how do we as medical professionals go about like treating and gaining trust of those um, adolescent youth who have been hurt by the medical um, assistant? Oh, it's such a good question. Um, what I'll say, I often say this to medical students as well, is what I say is I name it. If I see it, I name it. And I often um, really make myself not vulnerable per se, but 
I bring myself down a little bit. So I, if it's a child who's trans or who's LGBTQIA and they're, and they tell me, or I, um, it's clear in medical notes prior, I might actually say, oh, tell me about your pronouns these days, or I'll ask them about that. And then I'll say, um, I don't know everything and I make mistakes all the time. So I wanna make sure I understand what's going on because I'm your doctor. And so I tell them when I don't know, I tell them when I'm wrong. Um, and I actually sometimes ask, so wait a minute, you're here for a medical evaluation and I, I might have to do a genital exam. Like, I want to make sure that that's okay. And I, I want to just check in about that because of your history of abuse or because of your identity or because of your previous experiences um, as a trans individual. Um, I just ask. And sometimes I get it wrong. I often miss the mark. All you can do is express your vulnerability and not knowing everything. So that's the individual answer. In terms of the systemic answer, I think that we're doing it, right? We're giving more education regarding LGBTQIA plus youth and adolescents. Um, hopefully health environments, healthcare environments will change um, and grow and improve and expand, which is always the best trajectory is growth. Um, and more research is going to have to be done and data will have to be collected as as it, as it will be um, to really understand the best way to support the health of these patients. Hopefully that answers the question. Yeah, it did. Um, so for so next question, it says, if you could make changes to the curriculum across the country to better prepare students to care for um, this specific population, what changes will you make and why? About changes to curricula. Is that what that was a question? Um, so let me think it, let me give it one second of thought. So there are lots of resources um, out there through the through all sorts of organizations, including um, GLAMA, GLMA, the American Academy of Pediatrics, and um, and other organizations regarding LGBTQIA plus youth. There is also UCF. Seth has a great website as well as something called WPATH, WPATH, um, all about these populations. And I think it, it's reasonable to use existing resources because what I'll tell you is that these resources have had lots and lots of um, experts creating them. Um, I think it also means having examples of cases when you're doing a case presentation or when you're talking about um, a medical issue, thinking about the healthcare needs of these populations. So it might mean doing it passively, saying, um, all right, so you're here with a 15-year-old trans male youth who's there with cellulitis, right? And so that's part of the education, part of the discussion. And maybe part of it is, okay, you're here with um, an individual who's a trans woman and who needs medical treatment um, in the context of her gender identity. So it could be that as well. Those are just some thoughts. Um, and I think there are many, many others and lots of people out there, lots of experts that have lots of resources um, in the field that are really important to utilize. Is there any specific book or resource you're gonna you could recommend for medical students in particular? So many. <laughs> um, for adolescent, for adults, or for children? Um, I, I think both. I both. So, um, in other lectures, what I've done is I've taken children's books and I've read them <laughs> during the lecture because there are just so many really good ones. You saw for children's books, you saw some of them on my presentation. So, Julian is a Mermaid is a beautiful book. Um, also, Mommy, Mama, and Me, that's about a family with two moms. Um, there are, I think the one that I included was Who Are You? And that is actually a really excellent book about gender identity. And there's many, many more um, for all ages. And I could probably, what I probably could do is just provide a list and give it to, to you to provide. Um, and then as for adults and the medical care for adults, one, some of the best resources are actually online. There are good books, but UCSF has a great set of resources, especially for trans individuals. And also um, WPATH for trans medicine specifically. Um, and for LGBTQ um, individuals, 
I can also create a list of books and re internet resources. Thank you. Our next question. So considering the prevalence of this issue, shouldn't this topic be covered um, uh, didact didactically and um, uh, rotate to a specific clinic for this population? Thank you, Dr. Finkel. Um, yes, yes it should. Um, it's a, what I'll say is that L trans medicine and LGBTQ youth, there is a huge um, vacuum of medical care for them specifically in Southern New Jersey. I view this as an excellent opportunity, one that I will be pursuing actively. Um, and I think it's, there's a lot of room for growth. I, there are some clinics that provide care specifically, but most of them are not central to Southern New Jersey. They're elsewhere. Um, so yes, the answer is yes. Next question. Um, do you have any specific book recommendations that caregivers can read to um, introduce them to the topic of raising an LGBTQIA child? Yeah, I would say I do. Absolutely. I have many, I have many lists and I have many at home. And I would say there's, it's never too early to start. I'll provide those lists. It's never too early to start. Um, children are expansive and beautiful and really understand um, nuance in a way that I as an adult do not. So providing them information just with regards to having characters and then having actual information about different identities um, is incredibly effective. Um, and I think some of the best ways to talk with kids about pretty much anything that could be LGBTQIA identities, that could be safe um, and unsafe um, situations that could be sexual abuse, pornography, that could be race and racism, all of those things, children's books are the answer. Also for adults potentially, but definitely for kids. So I, I have many that I can provide after the lecture. Uh, I don't know how much time you have for questions, but I just have um, some more for you. Like how do you see the population projection and care within the um, uh, healthcare like in the next five years? Like, do you think we're gonna gain more, I guess, um, um, more knowledge um, in treating them? Is it gonna be, is it going downhill? Is it going uphill? Like, how do you think the healthcare oh. is managing like, this um, uh, specific population? That's a great question. Um, I think it's expanding. I think there are lots of opportunities, both locally in New Jersey and also nationally. Um, I think research builds on itself. So, so somebody does some research and it grows and grows and grows. I have um, recently in the journal Pediatrics, which is the primary journal of the American Academy of Pediatrics, has published almost every issue for the last few months, something about um, gender nonconforming and transgender youth and or LGBTQ youth. So I think that it's, it's happening, it's growing. With regards to the medical care, I hope so. I hope it does continue to grow and I think I, I have confidence that it will. And that was the last of questions. Well, thank you so much today for your time. Thank you to everyone who came today and thank you to everyone who made this day possible, including the Dean's office and our mentors. We look forward to seeing you guys again in the next Amor Community Ground Round. Thank you so much. Thank you.